Hi, good afternoon. My name is Erica Crespo with the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle Program. And with me today, I have Deborah de Moulpier, our program's green living expert and the recent host of our Environment Learning Circle. How are you today, Deborah? I'm good. Thank you, Erica, for having me again. Of course. Thanks for joining us. It's always a treat. Um, what we are going to do today is go through a bit of a rapid fire round of questioning for Deborah using some of the most popular questions from our recent virtual learning circle. So before we do that, though, I would like to explain what is a learning circle. If you haven't had the opportunity to join us for one, you might not know. Um, learning circles, which we do hold monthly, are free hour long conversations with our course experts. If you've gone through our course or, in the, or are in the process of going through our course, you know that our course consists of five key modules and that's mindset, diet, fitness, environment, and change. So what our learning circles do is give you the opportunity to expand on what you've learned or are currently learning through the Anti-Cancer Lifestyle online course. During our learning circles, our ACLP experts will summarize key points from each module and answer any questions you have about the module topic. Now, it is important to note that you do not need to have completed the course or the module topic at hand to join our learning circles, although, of course, that is always helpful. I would say the best part about our learning circles is it gives you the opportunity to connect to and, and really build your anti-cancer community, both with the experts and each other. Um, Deb, as you know, we love when people can turn on their videos and see each other um, as if we were all gathered in a support group setting. It, it's really nice community feel that that adds. Um, it's also the, your opportunity to ask questions directly to our learning circle experts, like we'll be doing with Deborah today. So that brings us to the current moment. Um, myself with Deborah, we just recently held our environment learning circle, and these were some of the most popular questions asked over the course of that hour. So we're going to get into it in a second here. Really quickly, though, I do want to give our viewers, Deborah, a little background on yourself in case they aren't familiar with you. So Deborah is a green living expert and athletic trainer. She received a master's degree in education from the University of New Hampshire and spent years in the health field as a certified athletic trainer. She's worked as a college athletic trainer and has taught dance and fitness. Deborah was a founder of an environmental green goods store in New Hampshire and is active, very active in the environmental community. In order to choose the cleanest possible products for her store, Deborah spent years researching and vetting companies and products so that her customers could be confident that the brands she carried were the safest ones available. She created the in-person version of our ACLP environment module and has taught it since 2011, in addition to the online module, which if you've taken our course, you've seen her. She is a frequent guest lecturer at cancer support groups and organizations interested in a less toxic lifestyle. And as you know, if you've taken our course, she teaches in the module areas of environment and fitness. Okay, so I think after all that, I can finally start <laughs> asking the questions, which everyone clicked on this link, I'm sure, to, <laughs> to learn about. All right, Deborah. So the first question I have for you is already up on the screen, and that is what types of personal health products are safe? Okay, well, I guess all types of personal health products have the potential to be safe. So I guess it, it matters well what company is making this type of, of healthcare products. So um, it, it comes down to the company and usually what ingredients they're using. And the good news is there are lots and lots, thousands of companies who have great products out there that are, are safe and uh, great to use. Uh, the question is finding them. Mm -hmm. So uh, a couple ways to find them. Um, we recommend, especially in the course, um, there's an organization called uh, Environmental Working Group, and they've done a lot of research on toxins, and they have a great database. They have two databases. Mm -hmm. One is called ewg.org, uh, Skin Deep, and then they also have a cleaning products database. So that's going to give you a lot of products. Um, they rank them. I recommend that you stay in the green category. Um, and they also talk about the ingredients. But for instance, on the Skin Deep database, they have over 80,000 products. 
So you really should be able to uh, find a product that you're interested in, see what EWG, EWG says about it. Or if you mm -hmm. have a product that you question the ingredients on it, plug in. What I do is just Google the ingredient followed by EWG and see if EWG uh, has said something about it, if they rank it, if they talk about it, or if it's on their radar. It's, it's very easy to do. So that's going to that's gonna, uh, get you to the um, products that are safe uh, and get you on your way. So I hope that helps. Yeah, and we just brought up those sites that are scrolling through the bottom of our screen right now, and I'll leave those up for a little while longer so people can note them. Um, Deborah, my next question for you is, what type of cookware is the least toxic to use? Is there a type? Yes. So uh, in my mind, there are four of the least toxic uh, cookware to use, and they are um, cast iron, stainless steel, uh, real ceramic, and glass, period. So um, those are the least toxic ones. Are they absolutely benign? Do they absolutely not leach anything? No, they might leach a little something. You know, iron leaches iron, stainless steel, maybe a little nickel. Um, but those are all things that, that we can deal with. So um, there is another category called anodized aluminum. Uh, and if it were just anodized aluminum, that would be fine for cooking. But unfortunately, mm -hmm. most of the companies put a coating on it, and it's usually a Teflon type coating. My experience is the companies making these pans are not really transparent about what they're using. Mm -hmm. So I just would recommend stay away from anodized uh, aluminum. Um, it, it's not superior to the stainless steel. And so, but anyway, I, I did want to note that. Then we have the non-stick category. And there are two major kinds of coatings that, that fall under non-stick. So the first one most people are familiar with, and that's your Teflon category. Mm -hmm. um, and we call it Teflon, but it's really the family of chemicals called PFAS. Uh, so that's a family of about 5,000 different PFAS chemicals. But the most famous ones used for pans and, and the coating are the PFOA and the PFOS, um, which are used to then make another compound called PTFE. So it, really, in theory, this PTFE compound that's made from the PFAS is actually not super toxic, it's it's inert. Mm -hmm. But in the manufacturing of it, sometimes there's a little PFAS left over and so that's where your exposure comes in. The biggest problem is these pans are made at a factory and that's where the pollution is, is bad for the environment. Mm -hmm. This is a chemical that basically should be banned for non-essential use and they're actually talking about doing that in um, Europe. Uh, because it's the most um, detrimental chemical on earth. It's called the forever mm -hmm. chemical. It's absolutely horrible. And it just should not be even purchased for, again, non-essential use. So wow. please stop using Teflon. <laughs> um, <laughs> uh, the other thing is, if you heat a Teflon pan and you overheat it, and that famous, famous smell from a Teflon pan, or from using um, the cleaning mode on an oven because mm -hmm. it's usually coated with PFAS, there's a distinct smell. Mm -hmm. Those are called um, Teflon fumes. Those are toxic, not mm -hmm. necessarily carcinogenic, but they're toxic, mm -hmm. um, but it's not Teflon, it's another kind of toxin. And, and they, can, they can make you sick, it's called Teflon flu. They kill birds, and so, um, overheating the pan is actually um, probably the worst toxic exposure in terms of Teflon. Uh, but I have a real issue with the whole manufacturing of it. There are toxin, um, Teflon toxin uh, contamination sites all over the country now, mm -hmm. and, and they're really problematic. So uh, that's the Teflon nonstick category. Then we have the other nonstick category called, uh, quote, uh, ceramic coated pans. So they're fairly new to the market. Um, they're, they're not horrible. They're made with silicon. Uh, but the problem mm -hmm. is they're mixed with a whole bunch of additives. And we don't know what those additives are always because the company doesn't tell you. There can be more stable coatings and there can also be coatings that are 
less stable and they break down and they crack and and before you know it you're ingesting them there's not a lot of research on them um, the research we have we do know they are not perfectly benign um, but they're also not horrible so um, my issue with them is they actually break down quickly and so some pans last a year you know people will say oh I had to throw my pan out in two years so again if you're thinking about the whole environment you're talking about products that have to be made frequently. Again, there's pollution at the factory site. And so the whole cycle of the product, in my mind, uh, is not great for the environment, which ultimately affects us as humans. So getting back to the least toxic options, we are talking about cast iron, stainless steel, real ceramic, because that's like glass, or glass by itself. So stick to those, learn how to use them, uh, most people overheat them and then things burn. Uh, so if you learn to use them properly, uh, you'll fall in love. So try those. Awesome. Well, thanks so much for that thorough answer. You had me thinking, we just cleaned our oven recently, that self-clean mode. And I know the smell you're talking about. And we did open the windows. Oh, good. And I actually stood, out, I actually stood outside the house for a little bit because I was oh, like, good. Hmm, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not sure about this. So that is very useful uh, for myself to know. And speaking of just being at home more, we're all at home more because of COVID and a lot of our homes uh, might have carpeting. So our next question is, what can I do to minimize the toxicity and mold uh, of mold and chemicals in carpeting? Yeah, uh, carpeting uh, poses two problems. One is, what is it made out of? So mm -hmm. sometimes, you know, it's um, basically plastic, petroleum based, then they add things like stain repellents. And again, that's your PFAS chemicals uh, and there's dyes. And so there's, you're talking about carpeting that is the inherent products it, itself, which can break mm -hmm. down and create dust that you breathe and all that kind of stuff. Then you right. have what goes into the product, into the carpeting. So basically that's dust or, you know, materials from the dog walking by or something like that. So, but the thing with carpeting is it looks great, right? It, it, it covers all that stuff where if you just had a plain floor, you would notice the dust and the dirt and stuff like that. So um, carpeting has a bunch of stuff in it. The question is how do you clean it really well? And if you're really concerned about um, your carpeting, I really suggest professional cleaners coming in and doing what's called st hot steam cleaning. That's gonna get down deep. They have a, a, a suction thing that just sucks the heck out of it. It goes through a, a big tube sometimes out, in, out of your house into a truck um, or a big machine. And it, it is the um, best way to uh, clean your carpets. Um, so it's, it's worth every penny and, and I, I suggest frequent, maybe doing it once a year, um, mm -hmm. and, uh, do that. The con with that is you have to be careful because it does need to dry. It's being steam clean. So maybe you want to do it, uh, depending on what the weather is, oh, you know, so it's more summertime, um, and you have to allow it to dry so you can't walk on it. But other than that, it's a super way to clean the carpets. As far as mold goes, that's a moisture issue. And so um, maybe you need a dehumidifier, especially if the carpeting's in the basement, um, but mold is, usually comes from moisture. So again, you have to be mindful of that in terms of the carpeting. So I hope that helps. Thank you. Um, our next question is, what are the five sources of environmental toxins? Okay. I think what's meant by that question is, um, how are we exposed to chemicals? So what are what are what are the exposure routes we call them in terms of human contamination? So there technically are five, but really three are the are the major um, routes of exposure. And we have a little way of remembering them. We have we say in, on, and around. So think of exposure routes uh, coming in. So that's what you ingest. So that's coming in through your mouth. But also mm -hmm. when you're breathing, it hits your mouth and then you ultimately swallow it and you ingest it that way. Um, the on part is on your skin, on your scalp. Uh, so mm -hmm. you want to think contact. And that doesn't just come from lotions or shampoos. It can come from your clothing. So depending on what is uh, uh, on your clothing can actually contact your skin and you can get exposure roots that way. 
And then the around part is the air around you. So um, that's a huge topic. Uh, mm -hmm. And in my mind, it's actually the most important one, but it sounds good to say in, on, and around and remember it that <laughs> way. So those are your three major exposure routes. The other two are, are your eyes because they're moist and, and actually things can go in through your eyes. Um, you can absorb things that way into your system. And the other one is technically injections. So, um, but those are usually things we don't deal with in, in the anti-cancer lifestyle program. So those are your five, uh, those are your five sources. And you mentioned the air we breathe, which of course we're all thinking about more these days. So that right. leads us into the next question. How can we reduce the exposure to environmental toxins such as pollution? Okay, so I'm, I'm thinking that this question meant pollution on the outsides of your home. Uh, in that case, um, that can be difficult because sometimes it depends on where you live, especially city living or next to an industrial site. Uh, and so some of the precautions you can take with that are, are making sure your inside home is cleaner or these days just wear a mask. I mean, especially in summertime, we actually have, you know, high pollution days and there are alerts mm -hmm. for that. So they tell you to stay indoors. but Again, mask wearing, just like for COVID, can help you under those uh, conditions. But if you're on the inside, sometimes that air from the outside comes inside. And so a way mm -hmm. to help clean your air on the inside is one is to avoid the pollution or other contaminants in your air. But air purifiers are actually getting um, pretty good these days. I, I can't remember a one offhand. You can Google the best and, and do your own research. And some of them are, are quite good. Um, portable ones you can carry from room to room. So are you sitting in the living room or you know put it in your bedroom at night because you spend a lot of time there and that might purify your air a little bit better. Um, so that's, that's a way of reducing toxins. And then just make sure on the uh, inside of your home that you're not putting more toxins into the air. So things like uh, candle burning, uh, or, you know, you're cooking, make sure you have your vent uh, working over your hood, um, fragrances that you might be using or cleaning products that, that give off VOCs um, or solvents or anything that you might be using in the home. Leave your shoes off um, at the door before you come in because the dust associated with that dust goes into the air. Lots of things are attached mm -hmm. to dust. And so you want to uh, reduce breathing that as well. So, um, it's a tricky situation. Uh, that's why um, the around part or the air we breathe is so important because we are exposed to so many toxins just through the air. So I hope that helps. Thank you. And I've noticed with wearing my mask outside, I'm usually prone to severe allergies and they've definitely been less this year. So it's I might true, have to yeah. that. keep using that going forward because those could be quite painful. Right. Um, my next question for you is, what is the best resource for researching product safety? Okay, so um, for product safety, if you're talking about personal care products and cleaning, EWG is terrific. So we talked about that, the, uh, the Skin Deep and the mm -hmm. uh, Cleaning Guide. So those are two huge product categories. So that's going to help um, in terms of product research there. Another way to research is also just Google the product and follow it by the word toxicity. And sometimes you have blogs talking about it or even um, uh, websites who, again, have databases that will refer to this product. But there is mm -hmm. a, a database that I just think is fantastic, and it's called whatsinproducts.com. And it used to be the household um, database, uh, but mm -hmm. now this is its new name. And it has everything that you might uh, find at home. Every It includes personal care products and cleaning products, but it goes beyond that. It does crayons and artwork and automotive things and pesticides and pet, pet things, pet beds and pet toys and all sorts of stuff. It's really a terrific website. And they've really brought it up to date. So if you if you find the product you're interested in, they tell you they red flag chemicals of concern that are in that product, which is 
uh, terrific. And um, it, it's massive. So I really recommend that that website, whatsinproducts.com. Super resource. Um, the other one I think I forgot to mention is uh, EWG has um, an app for your phone and it's called Healthy Living. So it uses the Skin Deep database and the cleaning um, database. And so if you're in a store and you're wondering, oh, this looks kind of good, but I don't know anything about it, just hold the phone app up to the barcode. And if it's in the database, it will tell you all about it. It's pretty cool. So that's called the Healthy Living app. So you can find that on your Google Play Store or whatever it is. So. Thank you. That sounds really useful. I'm going to have to upload that onto my yeah, phone. Yeah, pretty cool. Yeah. So when we're talking about using cleaning products to kill COVID, um, we had a question that was really interesting. How do we also avoid exposure to the harmful agents that might be in those cleaning products? Yeah. So the, the really good news here is you don't need to be exposed to harmful agents really be, because the basics really work. So there are no cleaning products that kill COVID and other germs 100%. They bring it up to 99.9 .9 or 99.99%. So um, the good news is plain old alcohol, 75% above kills mm -hmm. that 99.9% and hydrogen hydrogen peroxide also does both of those are are harmless in terms of using it as a cleaner of course mm -hmm. you don't want to tr drink it <laughs> um, but as far as just as a cleaning agent it's perfectly fine uh, to use those those are inexpensive easy to well they're easy to find now um, so just again, plain old alcohol or hydrogen peroxide. We have been led to believe that you have to use things like bleach or extra special cleaning products. And even the EPA has um, a new part of their website for COVID cleaning products. And mm -hmm. there are about 500, over 500 cleaning products listed uh, on there. And so many of them, uh, have um, a chemical called, uh, what is it, uh, quaternia, quaternia uh, ammonium, and we call mm -hmm. it quats. And uh, I'm talking hundreds of products have this ingredient in it. It's not mm -hmm. a good ingredient. It is an endocrine, mm -hmm. dis endocrine disrupting chemical. Uh, it has a lot of issues, uh, and it's in a lot of the products. So, and it's that's listed on the EPA in terms of its, um, active ingredient. So you do want to stay away from products that have that as an active ingredient. Again, stick to your 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 alcohol, your hydrogen peroxide. I'm not wild about bleach um, and mm -hmm. never ever mix bleach and ammonia. Again, sp uh, stick to the basics and even hot water and soap um, are terrific at cleaning. All the cleaning e agents require what's called called dwell time. That means it, the whatever you're using has to sit on the surface for a certain amount of time. Sometimes it's five seconds, sometimes it's 10 seconds. Uh, but there is that, and it just makes sense that it's going to have the opportunity to kill more of the germs the longer that it sits on there. So a flat surface area, that's easy to do. Doorknobs, not so much. Um, so keep that in mind, that's called dwell time. And very important, rinse everything. Otherwise, what you're doing is you're just smearing all the germs around together and that stuff is still on the surface area. And I just think that's kind of gross. So just make sure you rinse everything with good hot water. It's pretty simple. It's inexpensive. And you don't have to be exposed to harmful agents that way. Love it. Thank you. And sure. we are on our last question for today. And that is, what is the best website to check for food ingredients? Yeah, this was an interesting question because uh, food ingredients usually is in uh, my home front there. Uh, so I did look it up a little bit because I'm assuming they don't mean the ingredient ingredient of broccoli in a in a prepackaged mix or something like that. So I'm thinking that they're talking about additives in foods, which there are a lot of additives. Um, the FDA has uh, its own database because they regulate food additives. Okay, so the FDA bar, in my opinion, is kind of low, but they still do regulate it. 
so you can access the FDA um, food ingredients and their database for uh, additives and get you started there. Mm -hmm. But there's also a really cool uh, website um, called, well, you can just Google it, Chemical Cuisine. And um, the URL is cspinet.org. Um, and it's done by the Center for Science in the Public Interest. And mm -hmm. that's a really cool uh, website as well. And they, they present the food additives in a very easy to use way. And I really recommend uh, going to that uh, website if you're interested in the additives and the safety of them. Uh, it's a super resource as well. So that's for your food additives and ingredients. So I hope that helps. Thank you, Deborah. I really appreciate all the answers you've given today and the time you've spent with me. And, and I'm sure our viewers will too. And My pleasure. if you, yeah, and if you as a viewer are watching this and thinking, man, I need to join the next learning circle so I can ask my question, um, please do. You can visit our website at anticancerlifestyle.org. Under our events tab, you will see all our upcoming learning circles and webinars, which are free. All of them are free that you can join us at. So thank you again, Deborah, for joining My me My pleasure, today. thank you, Erica. And we'll talk to you soon. Have a good day, everyone.